Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this week on our Philips Security Research 11.15 morning call. Today, we have a few stock counters that we'll be discussing, as well as some technical analysis and ending it off with our Singapore Weekly. Also, do note that our last weekly market call will be on the 12th of December, and it will resume back on the 9th of January next year at 11 a.m. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the time to John to talk about C Limited. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so for today, we'll be covering uh, C's uh, third quarter 2022 results. Um, in terms of uh, revenue, uh, the revenue actually beat expectations by 7%, so at 3.2 billion US dollars in revenue. Uh, most of this was driven by uh, Shopee growth, uh, which grew 32%. Uh, net loss also was a beat, um, and this was, was mainly due to employee expense cuts uh, and more prudent spending on sales and marketing. Uh, in terms of uh, their the year-to-date uh, revenue and net loss, it, it comes in at 69% and 73% of our forecast. Uh, so we have three positives. Uh, the first was uh, revenue and earnings beat, uh, like I mentioned earlier, on Shopee growth and cost-cutting measures. Uh, so, so Shopee actually grew uh, 32% and C-Money grew 147%. Uh, and, and Shopee growth mainly came, comes uh, because of growth in their yeah, GMV uh, as well as the increase in tip. Uh, in terms of earnings, earnings beat due to number one, revenue beat. Um, and number two, there was a sequential decline in expense growth. Uh, growth uh, and this comes as, as the company prioritizes uh, its self-sufficiency uh, and profitability without external, external funding. Uh, so when you take a look at, at, um, at, at operating expenses, uh, which, which grew in line with revenue but was down uh, almost 11% a quarter on quarter. Um, and, and then as you look uh, down a little bit deeper into the sales and marketing expense, this number decreased 19% year on year um, and 16% quarter on quarter. So, so they're actually, the company is actually making a, a very conscious effort into reducing uh, a lot of its uh, sales and marketing spend and just uh, operating expenditure in general. Uh, second positive is that that there is actually is uh, improving monetization for Shopee that's actually driving its revenue growth. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, 32% year-on-year increase in revenue. Uh, and, and this was led by uh, growth in GMV and gross orders. So GMV is gross merchandise value, uh, which essentially is all the, 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 the total value of all the transactions uh, sold on Shopee. Um, and, they also, and, the, and the main thing is that they also increased their take rate, which is essentially their commissions by 1.5% uh, so year on year. So you can see, you know, you know, their GMV and gross orders, which is essentially volumes increasing and at the same time, uh, their commissions are increasing. So, so to a certain degree, their prices are also increasing uh, at the same time. Uh, in terms of uh, profitability, uh, operating loss improved 21% for Shopee uh, year on year to uh, about 0 0.6 billion US dollars. Uh, and this is mainly driven by a 16% year on year reduction in sales and marketing spend. Uh, so the, the last positive is, is C Money, which is uh, C's digital financial services business. Uh, so this actually continued to show improvements in cost efficiency. Um, and a significant reason is also because they decreased their sales and marketing expense, which was down 33% year on year. Uh, growth, uh, revenue growth was 147%, so it basically tripled its uh, revenue base. Uh, and this was driven quite significantly by a healthy credit business, which uh, actually has about 2.2 billion US dollars on its loan book right now. Uh, in terms of weakness, we continue to see weakness in gaming uh, to weigh on Garena, which is, is uh, C's only profitable, bu profitable business right now. Um, revenue for Garena was down 90%. Uh, this was as a, re as a result of uh, declining user engagement and monetization. Uh, so qu quarterly active users were down and qu quarterly paying users were down about 45% uh, year on year. Um, C also Revise its booking guidance for FY22 um, to a range of 2.6 billion to 2.8 billion. Uh, and, and this represents almost a 40% uh, expected quarter to quarter drop for bookings in the fourth quarter this year. Uh, in terms of the outlook, uh, we continue to see reopening trends to uh, continuing to hurt Garena. Um, and, and, and this is, is a bit concerning because Garena is, is its only profitable segment. Uh, for Shopee, we continue to see resilient growth, and, and there's also a clearer path to profitability with um, Malaysian and Taiwan recording uh, positive adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter of this year. 
the company is continuing to shift its focus into more prudent investment spending. Uh, and and this, this actually should improve its margins uh, quite significantly uh, and, and as well as improve investor returns sooner rather than later. In terms of valuations, we maintain a buy with an unchanged target price of 110 US dollars with a WAC of 7.6% and a growth rate of 3%. So that's it for C. I'll move to Grab. Um, we actually are doing a fill-up on the ground for uh, Grab's third quarter 22 results. Um, in terms of their results, they had uh, revenue growth of about three times, so 143% year-on-year growth to 382 million US dollars. Um, at, at the same time, their net loss also improved 65% to, three, to 342 million US dollars of net loss. Uh, so significant... Si uh, one of the reasons why revenue grew so much was uh, rebound in, in both mobility as, as uh, there, were, there were strong, uh, I guess, easing of COVID-19 restrictions, uh, as well as deliveries that, that grew quite significantly. Uh, in incentives were down about 10% quarter on quarter, uh, and, and, but was up slightly on a year-on-year -year basis. And this was also one of the main reasons why um, their net loss actually improved uh, quite a significant amount. So there's a combination of, of revenue growth as well as cutting down on, on incentive spend. If we take a look at some of their individual segments, uh, deliveries grew, uh, revenue grew 250% year on year, or 271% in constant currency. Uh, and, and there's several reasons for this. Firstly, they, the company actually increased their take rate uh, by 3% year on year to 21.2%. Um, and secondly, they, they also... Uh, Earlier this year, they, they acquired Jaya Grosso in Malaysia to, to kind of expand their, their um, uh, I guess, mart delivery uh, business in, in, in Malaysia. And so, so this is one of the reasons why uh, there was quite a big jump in terms of revenue um, because, of, because of, they just have more options in, in Malaysia and they're actually doing uh, partnering with, with other companies in in uh, different countries like Indonesia and Philippines to kind of expand their, their uh, supermarket deliveries business. Uh, in terms of, of profitability, they were positive adjusted EBITDA uh, for the first time. And this comes three quarters, three to four quarters ahead of its guidance, which is expected to. Uh, so the company actually expected deliveries to be positive adjusted EBITDA only in the third quarter of next year, second to third quarter of next year. Uh, in terms of mobilities, their revenue grew about 100%. Um, and, and this was, was mainly due to uh, uh, reopening or easing of a lot of COVID restrictions in countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, in, in terms of, of uh, driver demand, uh, one, one of the, the big, uh, rather one of the interesting things was that uh, the management actually mentioned that, that driver demand remains strong in most countries, especially in Singapore. Uh, but the only issue in Singapore is that uh, because there's a shrinking COE quota, it kind of caps the supply on vehicles uh, that the drivers are actually able to, to rent and drive. And so this is actually driving prices uh, a, a little bit higher. Um, so if you, if you notice in Singapore, it, that your grab prices are, uh, are going up and have, been, have remained at quite elevated levels, this is probably one of the reasons why. Uh, it, in summary, for, for grab, uh, GMB growth is in line. Uh, you, you know, a uh, uh, good thing is that their net loss continues to improve. Uh, uh, kind of similar to see they are focusing a little bit more on, on reducing their spend, uh, um, and, and and focusing more a bit more on their bottom line. Uh, they're slowing hiring and streamlining a lot of functions. So a lot, some of the teams have actually reduced headcounts. Uh, and they're not hiring as much, uh, especially in such a weak uh, macro environment. Um, incentive spend, like I mentioned earlier, was down uh, two percent year on year. Uh, and, and one of the other positive things is that they actually raised their full year FY22 revenue guidance by about 5%. So all, all in all, a, a very strong set of results for, for Grab, increasing revenue and, and reducing expenses, but uh, they're still quite a, quite a while away from, from actually being profitable uh, as, as a whole business. Uh, yeah. So, so that's all for Philip on the ground for Grab. I'll pass my time on to Max. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So we also attended UMS Holdings uh, the quarter 22 results briefing call. And this is the clip on the back. Uh, just as a disclaimer, this counter is not rated. So UMS Holding, uh, as a brief background, UMS Holding has a market cap of around 823 million sing dollars. And its main business is to, pro is to provide uh, semiconductor components as well as uh, providing 
assembly lines integration services for uh, front end semiconductor companies. So this means that their customers are, are front are companies who produce semiconductor manufacturing equipment and applied materials is actually the key customer. Uh, the, it's the quarter revenue, 2020, the quarter 2020 revenue actually jumped 48% to 101 million sing dollars. And this actually brought the, the total nine months 2022 revenue to 271.4 million dollars. And this surpassed the full year amount that it achieved back in April 21. Net income jumped 173% year on year to 43.9 million. And this is partly because of the income tax credit from its uh, Malaysian subsidiaries, where it was granted the pioneer tax status by the local government. If we roughly strip off this effect, the profit before tax was actually at, uh, came in at 32 million sing dollars, signifying a 77% jump. Uh, management has indicated that the, that the strong performance was mainly due to its uh, core semiconductor business while sales surged 50%, and this is driven by the 103% increase in its integrated system sales, as well as the 80% increase in its component sales. And the, the increase in sales in both in the semiconductor segment is mainly because of the increased order from its existing key customer. Uh, during the call, uh, geographically, Management has indicated that Malaysia was the segment that grew the most during the quarter, with sales surging 104% to 5.8 million. And this is due to the company uh, commencing the first article fabrication for its new customer. And, and the management has also explained to us the effect of the recent US uh, semicon restriction on China. And it, and it says that uh, the, uh, the sales that were lost to its Chinese competitors in the past have started to come back to UMS. And, uh, this means that uh, uh, the, its key customer who is starting to uh, shift its part sourcing out from China and UMS was able to recapture some of those sales. And one of the major highlights during the call was actually the Penang plant. So UMS has acquired the agent, the a land, a piece of land adjacent to its current uh, production plan. And this new plan is, is mainly to serve the demand for its new customer. The Penang plan is expected to complete by the end of this year, and it is also scheduled to start producing in the middle of next year. Uh, however, management has indicated that it will take at least three to four years until the plant is uh, until the plant reaches its full utilization. As for the outlook, uh, the company believes that the performance will be will remain robust for the next six months. And this is because it still has a huge order backlog from its key customer that has yet to be produced and delivered. Uh, so uh, the, the load forecast given by its key customer, which is in this case, applied materials, is unlikely going to fit, is unlikely going to be significant, have a significant impact on UMS. So uh, that's all for me for UMS holdings. Uh, I'll pass my time on to Glenn for Civil League. Thank you. Thanks, Max. So for Silver Lake, and uh, they recently announced their first quarter uh, FY23 earnings. Uh, the earnings of 57.6 million ringgit were in line with our estimates at about 28% of our forecast. And uh, the earnings, the first quarter earnings actually in surged 64% year on year. And this came from higher software licensing and software and hardware sales, which were offset slightly by lower software project services. So I'll jump straight into the positives. The first positive was that their project-related revenue increased 107% year-on-year. Their software licensing revenue spiked more than six-fold year-on-year to 39 million ringgit. And this was largely contributed to by the delivery of new software licensing contracts, as well as banking deals secured in Indonesia and Thailand. However, this was offset by the software project services revenue declining 31% to 14 million ringgit. Nonetheless, a new implementation project secure in Thailand has just commenced and the revenue for this will be recognized progressively in the subsequent periods. There are also a few new other project services which are at the final stage of contracting. For the second positive is that Silver Lake's order backlog remains healthy and their project pipeline is also healthy at 2.1 billion ringgit. So this is higher compared to the previous quarter at 1.9 billion ringgit with a healthy order backlog of 400 to 450 million ringgit. 
Silver Lake is also beginning to close more deals and is witnessing an uptick in inquiries about its financial services, market solutions, and capabilities. For neg negatives, there's one negative, which is that the recurring revenue dipped 2% year-on-year. Their maintenance and enhancement services fell 8% year-on-year to 109 million ringgit. As although the maintenance revenue was stable, their enhancement services revenue fell due to delays in work order sign-offs or acceptance by customers which missed their revenue recognition in the first quarter. But nonetheless, this was offset by an increase in their insurance ecosystem transactions and services revenue by 74% year on year as the vehicle claims processing activities recovered, as well as increased revenue from their new operations in Japan and UAE. The revenue from their retail transactions processing also increased 229% year on year. This was mainly due to higher subscriptions by pharmaceutical and retail customers in Malaysia and Singapore. For the outlook, their Mobius banking platform remains the differentiator. Uh, launched in 2020, Silver Lake's Mobius cloud banking software allows banks to roll out their new digital products in a targeted and timely manner. Mobius also allows banks to use their existing core banking software and propel them to new digital heights. Silver Lake recently signed a deal with one of the largest banks in Thailand for Mobius and is continuing to see increasing inquiries in the region. We also expect Mobius to generate almost 100 million ringgit of orders over the next two years. Secondly, uh, their annuity type revenue, which is their recurring maintenance and enhancement revenue, contributed to more than 70% of FY22 and 65% of their first quarter revenue. And it grew at a KGA of 4% despite the COVID pandemic. Silver Lake's core banking software, which is their Silver Lake Integrated Banking Solution, or SIPS, and the continuous maintenance and enhancement provide a steady stream of recurring business for the group. With the opening of borders as well as economies in ASEAN, we can expect that Silver Lake's customers to increase their IT spending to accelerate their digitization plans to grow. As such, we maintain a buy rating on Silver Lake Exis with an unchanged target price of 49 cents. Our FY23 estimates remain unchanged. Our target price is tagged to 20 times PE, and this is at 80% of peer valuations, as well as uh, is 12% higher than the historical average PE of 17.9 times. And in our view, Silver Lake should be trading at a higher premium to its historical PE with the introduction of Mobius and the resumption of bank IT spending after the pandemic. So that's all I have for Silver Lake. I'll now hand it over to Zane. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for Straits Times Index, last week we saw the rally test the 3,300 uh, key resistance level, which was uh, the confluence of a downtrend channel, another trend channel, as well as the, the swing high resistance back in September. So this week, I think we could see a possible pullback to about the next to the immediate support zone at 3,140 to 3,180 area. The confluence of the 30.2% and 50% Fibonacci retracement levels, where we could see a feeling of a price gap as well as a retest of the key uptrend support line. Next slide. Uh, for S&P 500, last week, uh, it was mostly uh, uh, trading in a 3,900 to 3, uh, 4,000 zone last week. Uh, was a lot of indecision. So, uh, the resistance and support level still remain the same for this week. The resistance will be at 4,000 to 4,130 area, which is the uptrend channel uh, resistance, the key downtrend line, as well as the 61.8% to 78.6% Fibonacci uh, levels resistances. For the immediate support wise, it will be at 3,800 to 3,900, which is the confluence of the uptrend channel support as well as the 38.2% to 50% Fibonacci retracement levels. Next slide. For individual stocks, uh, there's two of them. The first one will be Capital Read. So for Capital Read, we have a technical buy at 90 and a half cents, uh, the take profit at $1.04. The stop loss can be placed at 86 cents. The stock last closed at 90 and a half cents on Friday. So for this, we see a potential bounce to retest the resistance area at $1.03 to $1.06 in the current downtrend. This is because uh, the price broke out of the main downtrend channel it was trading in on 11 November. 
after the recent sell down had tested the swing low support uh, form at 89 and a half cents in late October 2020, which created a double bottom that is confluent with the support zone of 86 cents to 93 cents. The MACD technical indicator uh, is also showing signs of bullish momentum with the sustained crossover of the MACD line over the signal line. The, thus, the price could reach the $1.04 level in the resistance area of 103 to 106, which is confluent with the downtrend resistance line and a 50% Fibonacci retracement level when we use a recent swing high of $1.23 and recent swing low of $0.86. Cents. Next slide. So the other one would be Nucor Corporation. For this, we have a technical buy at $145.65, uh, take profit at $186.16. The stop loss can be placed at $130.70. The stop loss close at $142.03 on Friday. So for Nucor, we see a potential breakout of the key neckline resistance at the 145 level following a bullish double bottom formation which could lead us to retest the year high resistance at $186. So with the price testing this key neckline at $145 multiple times following this double bottom formation, a breakout would signal for more bullish upside to come with the price forming a series of higher lows along this uptrend support line prior to this. The MACD indicator is also showing bullish momentum with the sustained crossover of the MACD line over the signal line. So with that, the price could retest this year high resistance at $186.16 in the resistance area of $174 to $186. Well, this is confirmed with the projected target of the double bottom formation breakout, where the breakout high of 40, about $41 measuring from the double bottom support to the neckline resistance is projected onto the neckline resistance itself to determine the take profit target. So that's all for me for the technical analysis section. I'll now pass on my time to Paul to talk about q and results. Yeah, thanks. Uh, pre previous slide, please. Yeah. So, so, uh, with, uh, so q and reported their, their third quarter results. Uh, uh, in general, what we're seeing is that the expansion costs is starting to bite because they've been uh, aggressively expanding the uh, the number the uh, the footprint of dentists uh, in terms of the new clinics uh, in Singapore and Malaysia. Next slide. So the results was below expectations. Uh, year to date was about sixty percent of our full year. Uh, one of the reasons is the higher employee expenses and and so forth. Uh, if you look at the table on the left, the headline numbers uh, there's a sharp sixty two percent drop in earnings mainly because of the reduction in the uh, COVID-19 test revenue from acumen. Uh, in terms of the, the positives, so the franchise is still expanding. So there were three new clinics open in Singapore compared to eight and another two planned in October. So over the last 12 months, I think they've opened in Malaysia and Singapore, the, probably the most aggressive ever, like 24 clinics. Uh, uh, but right now, moving ahead, there was a slight change in the strategy. So what the priority now is also to fill the existing capacity in current clinics, uh, just basically to fill the chairs in, uh, with dentists in the current clinics before they start opening even more uh, new locations. In terms of the negatives, uh, it was basically the, the overall sluggish earnings. So if you look on the table on the left, the earnings for PetMe for dental was down 17%. So one of the reasons is that the performance of new clinics has been, has been softer. What had they've seen is that uh, with the border opening, uh, reopening, uh, the number of visitations have also come down. Uh, also, with the number of uh, search in pandemic, there's also been some disruption in opening of clinics and also uh, person, uh, sorry, uh, uh, patient flow into the clinics. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at the table on the left again, uh, sorry to jump around, but uh, you can see that revenue is down 26%, but employer expense was uh, virtually fat, flat. So what has happened is that uh, what has been causing a drag has been the stubborn employer expenses. Is they've been spending some money on development costs for the for their AI guided dental software. So uh, behind the background, uh, in the background, they're actually building a software, which will, which once rolled out, uh, it will indeed. So all dentists will have to use this software, and this software will independently give uh, what is the recommended treatment for patients in the clinics. So there's a lot of development costs in building this software. 
uh, there of course there's also recruitment costs to secure den uh, dentists. I think they are, they secured I think probably eighteen or twenty den new dentists into their into their franchise this year. And of course there's also startup costs when you open new clinic. It will take time for the dentist to mature and also to contribute to earnings. So in terms of uh, looking ahead, uh, the, so the, in terms of the outlook, no, despite the number of clinics expanding by almost eighteen percent to 106. Uh, we emphasize more on Singapore because Singapore clinics are the bigger contributor. Uh, revenue growth has been muted. So the reopening has shifted spending towards, of course, other discretionary spend like travel uh, and also the disruptions that we mentioned. Uh, what we think is that we look, we expect 2023 to be a recovery year, uh, mainly because the we are looking forward towards the new clinics uh, maturing because 18% is a huge jump in number of clinics and also they should start to contribute to earnings in 2020. 2023. Uh, we still maintain our buy, but we cut our target price. Uh, our we also because we lowered our earnings by almost 30%, uh, which is about uh three, four million. It's because the, the expenses are just running faster than we expected. And the surge in revenue hasn't come in as expected. Uh, but uh, why we're doing we value the core dental at 25 times PE and the uh, listed housing at a uh, market price with a 20% discount. Uh, next. Slide. Uh, in terms of Comfort Delco, next slide. Oh. Okay. Uh, so for Comfort Delco, again, the uh, earnings was a disappointment. Uh, mainly, the, Singapore did very well, but what happened was that UK and Australia earnings disappointed. Uh, I think the performance in UK and Australia was actually even worse than the pandemic. Uh, so for in terms of the 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 positives, the the earnings in Singapore uh, search. I mean, if you remove all the subsidies and everything, the operating profit from 2 million a year ago to 47 million uh, this quarter. Uh, the turnaround in Singapore was because of the surge in real traffic, uh, MRT real traffic, which is about almost 50% up and also lower taxi rebates. So last year, the taxi rebates was about 25%. Uh, this time round is 15%, uh, but, there's, but also there's a uh, booking commissions. So if you use the app, the taxi drivers have to pay commissions. And of course, there are also other private car hires that rent cars from them, which also uh, use this app. Uh, the other positive is, of course, uh, one of the reasons why we still like this stock is because of the, the strong cash flows that they're generating. And so for the third quarter, the cash flow is about almost 200 million. Uh, in terms of the, the negatives, the overseas was with a mega, big negative. So if you combine UK and, and uh, Australian profits, they were down almost 63%. The worst is actually UK. So what has happened in the UK is that uh, they've un they've been unable to pass the higher wage costs, namely because of bus drivers. There's uh, a big shortage of bus drivers. So to overcome this, they have to hire third-party bus drivers and also pay over time to the existing bus drivers. And to, to pass through, you need uh, 12 months. In, only in the anniversary of each individual contracts, uh, UK contracts, you can only pass through the higher costs. Uh, do not the business model is a service fee. So for buses, likewise in Singapore or in Australia or in UK, uh, uh, Comfort is just given a fee. Uh, there's no passenger risk. There's no capex risk. That's why uh, they are able to pass through or uh, all these costs to the to to actually technically to the government because they are the ones uh, who's uh, paying them this money. So in terms of the outlook, uh, we still think Singapore real and taxi will of course rebound in fourth quarter. Uh, the other boost in fourth quarter will be the increase in in uh, booking fee. Uh, one way to how to, how booking fee and taxi rebates uh, just a refresh. Rebates means you know maybe they rent the taxi hundred dollars, but they are only charging them uh, eighty five dollars because it's a fifteen percent discount. But right now they can also charge the booking fee, which is like one point five times. I know it's a bit confusing, but so technically they are actually recovering about seven point five percent in the rebates. Uh, a, a bit confusing here, but if you convert the commissions that the taxi driver pays, is about one and a half times of a, a daily rental, roughly. Um, real operations will also uh, get an uplift, uh, especially in FY23. So in, in October, uh, the PTC or, or the uh, uh, authorities here actually raised the fares for buses and, and MRT effectively by 13.5%. But as a passenger like, like us, we only pay 3%, 2.9%, uh, which is effective next month. 
Uh, so the rest of it, the government is going to give them a grant, give uh, mainly for real because uh, because for for bus is a contract, so it doesn't really matter. So for the real, they will technically get an adjustment. Uh, so just to differentiate again, uh, so for the real business, they take passenger risk and 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 also price risk because the revenue goes to 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 uh to comfort or SBS themselves. I know it's a bit confusing. For bus, it's just driving around in circle. They don't really care about passengers. But for the real uh, uh SBS takes the the passenger risk. Again, just to refresh, I know uh, in case anyone. Uh, the margin pressure from bus operations will persist, but I think you will get the gradual recovery as all the contracts hit their anniversary. I think probably mostly in FY23 rather than next quarter. Uh, so we maintain our buy, but we lower our target price. So Comfort is paying a 4% dividend, uh, dividend yield with about 600 million net cash. Uh, and, and also the share price is still trading 50% uh, below P pandemic. But we had to cut our, our earnings because of the, the weak performance in the UK and Australia uh, operations. Uh, next slide. I'll move on to Asian pay TV. Next slide. Uh, so for this, uh, the earnings would have been in line, but what happened was the Taiwan dollar uh, was hit by, it was down 5%. So as you know, Asian pay TV is, has oper is a cable operator and broadband operator in, in Taiwan. So when you convert it, of course, they, they, in Sing dollar terms, there was a 5 percentage points impact to, to revenues in Sing dollar terms. Uh, the distribution for third quarter was maintained at 0 0.25, uh, but they raised the distribution for FY23 to 1.05 cents for the full year. So uh, in terms of the positives, the, the broadband continues to grow uh, despite the currency headwind. It was, the revenue was up 11%. So there was a strong growth in subscribers and also in, in our pool, which is a selling price. Uh, the next part is uh, the, the negative for us has been the broadband cost. Uh, because although cable TV is coming down, the broadband cost is still stubbornly high. Uh, although basic cable is down 10%, broadband cost is still stable at 14, 14 million. And uh, what, what we do is we compute it as a percentage of revenue is at a record level of 30%. Uh, we, we, we still think that 2023 can there's a EBITDA growth for them because uh, what's happening right now the big transition right now is that the core cable business is is let's say losing about 14,000 subscribers uh, over 12 months uh, but the broadband is securing 33,000 subscribers over 12 months uh, but the key thing of course uh, basic cable TV selling price is higher so you net net your revenue comes down uh, but the one offsetting thing is that the broadband margins is higher. Broadband margins is 90% because there's no content cost. Uh, everything goes down to the bottom line of virtually. So it's about 90% uh, EBITDA margin. So the challenge for them, uh, which will cost the thing how much they can grow, or, uh, is, is for them to lower the content cost in line with the revenue. Because if the revenue can otherwise the content cost is now 30% of revenue. If they don't, you could climb to 30, 35 and so forth. So, uh, for us, most important is for them to, to try to contain further their content costs as they go for the next renegotiations next year. In terms of the impact for the higher interest rates, uh, the impact won't be meaningful uh, even until up to 2025 because uh, what has been most of it has been hitched. The one that's unhitched is the sing dollar. So if you assume a 2 percentage point rise in interest rates, it will impact their cash flows by 3 million. Uh, but their dividends they are paying, uh, if you go to the next slide at the bottom, they are paying about 19 million in dividends. Uh, uh, but their free cash flow is about 73. So even if you deduct three, they still have like 70 million cash to pay the 19 million, the last line at the bottom. Uh, most of the funds, they want to use it to just to pare down the debt. So we lowered our EBITDA uh, because, of the, uh, because we revised our Taiwan dollar forecast by almost... I think by almost six, by almost ten percent, uh, because we we don't really change uh, our currency forecast until the third quarter because the currency is so volatile. So we still maintain our buy, but we cut our target price uh, and we keep it in line with the Taiwanese peers. Uh, the stock is paying about nine percent dividend yield, based on nineteen million versus the cash flow they generate about seventy three. Which uh, this cash flow is also excluding interest and also ex excluding taxes. Uh, next slide. Uh, move on to our weekly. Uh, for the weekly, 
uh, ready RMC is ready mixed concrete, which essentially there's only two stocks involved in this, which is uh, Pan United and and also Hong Long Asia. So uh, for ready mixed concrete, it's starting to recover a little bit. Uh, you can see that the September volumes are up four percent. Uh, the last two months, August was up 4% year on year. Compared to first half, it was about 3%. So there's an incremental improvement in the demand for RMC. Uh, the taxi, number of taxis, uh, this is the industry-wide, continues to decline about uh, 7% year on year. Uh, I guess most of them are shifting towards private hire. That's why it's important also for comfort to, to get more... Uh, that's why they are securing more drivers on private hire, although they don't disclose the numbers as a couple of hundred. So as the taxi fleet string is important for them to, to transition more towards uh, customers hiring cars from them, private hire vehicles. Uh, in terms of new launch private, uh, private residential, it continues to be weak. In October, there was only 300 units sold compared to a year ago. So you're talking about 60-70% drop in volume. Uh, for for things out of the US, uh, right now our our focus has been you know, what commentary we can get from the from all the FOMC members. Although there are probably the last week there's probably like six to seven of them speaking, but we focus on the more important uh, FOMC members because these are the ones that are able to vote on interest rates. So basically, most of them are just saying that. Uh, uh, the first one is saying that they should slower the pace uh, because what most of them wor worry about that is that they've aggressively raised rates so they just want to pause a little while and see the impact of it. Of course, they still think they should raise rates. So uh, one is, is mentioned that the terminal rate, so terminal rate is where the interest rate, the level where the Fed will raise interest rates and maybe pause. So some of them are looking at 5 to 5.25. And they were paused. They do not. They are worried of policy mistakes in seven, like what they did in seventies, where they actually cut rates. So, uh, the other thing is just they just want to the more comfortable considering fifty basis points hike. Uh, another Fed officials uh, mentioned. So, in conclusion, based on what has all been mentioned, uh, we do see a greater clarity in where the interest rate direction is. So, what we think is there's going to be a fifty basis point hike or 0.5 percentage points increase in interest rates in December. I think the meeting is 12th December. Uh, then it will probably, the Fed will probably raise rates uh, to 4.75 to 5. So right now it's about 3.75. So maybe you will hit 4.25 by end of this year. Uh, and then another two more hikes and then they probably might pause in second quarter 23. Uh, I guess this is the base case for us and probably the base case for the market too. Uh, in terms of tactical costs, I think uh, if we are, since it's, uh, likelier that we're going to get a recession next year, it's going to be hard to call a market bottom. So if you look at the last few recessions, the market uh, typically bottoms where in the middle of an economic recession. So if you assume recession in next year, second half, so it's unlikely that the US markets will have bottom. Another thing to take note of is that uh, the, the market tends to bottom a few months after interest rate has started to be cut by the Fed. Of course, right now we are at the opposite, the rates are still climbing. So based on these two, um, these are, uh, again, these are historical, uh, these are precedents. It doesn't mean you're going to replicate it. Uh, but if you use these two historically, the market may not bottom until 2023, second half, or maybe even the fourth quarter. I'm talking about US markets. Uh, in terms, uh, we'll have some charts later just to explain what we mean. Uh, we also, we usually uh, provide a weekly market commentary in our in our community chat, if anyone's interested to, to watch, to read. Um, uh, so in terms of the webinar, uh, uh, sorry, in terms of events, there'll be a lot of uh, ch Chinese companies uh, announcing results of Baidu Xiaomi, if you're interested. The key thing to watch for the US will be the FOMC minutes uh, on the 23rd November. There'll be maybe some signs of whether they'll be pausing and so far. Uh, we'll be having one, uh, two webinars this week, uh, NIO and KTMG uh, based in Singapore. Uh, no, do register if you have the time. Uh, next slide. So uh, on the chat on the left, uh, the red line is the, the US market, uh, S&P 500. It's, uh, we, we, we log it. Uh, we have a log scale so that you can see the movements better. Because if, do uh, if you don't have a log, then it's going to be hard to see the prior periods. So if you if based on this, uh, the shaded area is when we had recession. So you can see that the market bottoms either in a recession or if you look at the year 2000 recession, it was like a few months 
I think seven, eight months after the recession. Uh, likewise, in 2020, so if you assume a recession happens in the second half of next year, again, nothing is certain, but if you make that assumption, then the US markets may not have bottomed until we are in the middle of a recession. Again, this is all historical precedence, even in the 1987, uh, even in the 80s recession, you can see that uh, the market only bottom might be harder to see, of course, but the market only bottoms in the middle of the recession. So the chart on the right is also shows that uh, when the market bottoms, uh, it's only after the Fed start to cut rates. Eh? So that's the worry now because the Fed hasn't even started to cut rates. And so if you the shaded area is the period when the Fed start to cut rates. So if you look at maybe, again, these are all recessionary periods. Every, no, uh, this is just a guide and it doesn't mean you're going to replicate again. Uh, 2019, when the Fed cut rate, is a light shade that you can't really see. Uh, you can see that actually the market still rallied. So that was a difference. I guess the difference is whether we get a recession. So you can you notice that in the year 2000 recession and even in the 2007 recession, it was even after the Fed started to cut rates, uh, the market didn't bottom until after that, a few months after that. So again, these are just uh, historical precedents, something just as a guide. It doesn't mean you replicate, but it's just something for everyone just to take note. No? So the title is if a recession 2023, the market, US market that we're referring to has not may not have bottom. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there were some other data points on the US consumer. So uh, the US retail sales continue to be actually quite he very healthy. Although you see the chart here declining, but it's if you compare to pre-pandemic, where US retail sales tend to grow maybe 3-4%, you can see that the October retail sales is still very strong. This is excluding motor vehicles because it's very volatile. Uh, so even if you take out inflation, of course, some say, you know, because uh, sales is strong because of inflation, even if you remove a 5-6% a inflation, it's still, uh, in terms of real terms, it's still stronger than uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, if you look at the inventories, which is something that we, we were worried about, it's starting to stabilize, although it's still elevated, but it's starting to stabilize a bit uh, in terms of uh, inventories in the department stores, total, and also inventory in some general merchandise stores. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'm just going to run through three companies that had a briefing last week. And I know we uh, we don't cover, and of course, some ask us why we talk about this, because sometimes we do get questions. And again, we do feel it on the ground is... Because um, no, most investors may not get access to all these briefings. So we just share the highlights for everyone to take note. So uh, Yoma announced their first half 23 results. Uh, they are still loss making. Uh, just a, a recap. So Myanmar is a, is a property developer. They operate KFC in Myanmar. You know, they also have auto distribution. And they also have a fintech arm. So the net loss was 11 million. I think the worry for... For Yoma, is the interest expense. So they have like almost of the losses, I mean, 9 million of it comes from interest expense. So and this is in US dollar terms. So if you analyze it, you're talking about 20 million of interest expense a year. All divisions are still loss making. Uh, the FMB has done better, the KFC, because last year there was a lot of dining restrictions and now that has been recently removed. So one of the major overhangs for Yoma is uh, Yoma Central. So just to refresh, uh, this was going to be a huge uh, development uh, next to in the center of um, of uh, uh, Yangon uh, because this one this uh, was supposed to have peninsula hotel it was next to uh, uh, next to um, next to the oil railway uh, and there was even some japanese partners involved in this but coincidentally the japanese partners actually written off the project uh, likewise uh, the peninsula also has also written off the uh, the cost of this project i think it was 100 million but anyway so for yoma they have a 100 million of us dollar debt tied to this project so right now this project has been suspended and they need to change the business plan because in this project there was supposed to be 2 million of retail and office space but of course with the cool uh, I don't think there'll be any foreign investors coming into this project. So right now, it's still a standstill with the lenders. So uh, the lenders have not called, but it's uh, it's like, uh, I guess it's just frozen uh, the, the loan because of the, all the disruption. Uh, the other challenge for them is also the central bank is also con controlling uh, controlling US dollar outflows. And, and do note that this is the US dollar debt. So, and because Yoma, most of their earnings is in, in the local currency, the Myanmar China. So it's going to be also challenging for them to pay out in US dollar. But just to get a sense of the situation right now in Myanmar, um, the government is prioritizing using US dollar to pay energy and healthcare. 
So anyone, any exports, uh, like 65% of it has to be converted into the local currency. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really bother your mark because they're not really exported, but I mean, just for your info. Uh, the for property, they still pay in US dollar link, but they collect it in Chan. Uh, so the other one is the their wave money, the fintech. Uh, the money transfer, I think this is just, just, uh, just for info. I mean, the money transfer is still not back to pre-cool level and so forth. I won't run through that. But uh, in terms of outlook, it's still going to be challenging for them. I think they have a 252 million of debt in US dollar terms. And so uh, the ability to repay this is going to be the going to continue to be the big overhang uh, for the stock, uh, in our opinion, of course. But next slide. Uh, for Tarsin Retail Trust, again, we had some questions last week. So we, we just run, there was a briefing. So we just run through. Uh, so Tarsin is a retail read. Uh, most of their malls in Greater Bay area, namely Chongsan, Foshan, and, and Chuhai. Uh, their MPI is down, the net property income is down. Uh, they actually did not pay any dividends because in the first half, although this is a third quarter briefing, but uh, operationally things are starting to improve a little bit because uh, their occupancy rate increased 92.6 to 92.9. And also some of the lockdown measures they see in China has started to shrink from two weeks to five days. Uh, the lockdowns, if there's an area, a mall affected, which lockdown from seven to two, uh, three days. But of course, the biggest overhang is going to be debt. So they have an offshore. If you look at the table on the right-hand side, uh, they have about 900 million of debt. Uh, but most of it is due in 2022. Uh, I mean, right now we're November, so it's due in one month. It's, most of it is due on 31st December. Uh, of course, they can't really say, because some of this has been pushed from September to November. They can't, they, of course, they didn't tell us that uh, they can, no, this is going to be refinanced, but all they just said was that uh, the challenge they face is that uh, there are a few, there are, this is a syndicated loan, there are a few lenders and everyone has their own conditions uh, which conflict one another. So this takes time to, to finalize all this. Uh, I'm just repeating what they said. Uh, uh, there's no demand on onshore, which is China, from Chinese banks. So they have to refinance out of here, uh, offshore in Singapore. Uh, so we did also ask them, you know, with the recent relaxation of property measures, whether will that help them? If you do recall, uh, uh, one or two weeks ago, the Chinese government has relaxed measures, you know, basically asking the banks to lend to the residential property. So whether this helps their parent and then so forth helps them, I mean, they just couldn't, there was no comment. Or they just said that it's still early and they need clarity. So, so again, just to reiterate, and that's the outlook. I mean, this is a purely a binary bet, the ability to, to refinance. Uh, they do have 100 million of cash on the balance sheet. Uh, of course, they can't cover the debt like all REITs. So it's just whether the how much, how long uh, are the bankers willing to refinance. So I guess another interesting takeaway is that uh, that uh, property loans that are not in the core city area, be it in Myanmar or be it in in in, uh, in second tier cities, uh, is that's the one that's going to be so. Any banks that have all these loans, that's the ones that are going to be, face the challenge to refinance. Uh, but of course, for this, the stock is 275, the NAV is almost 117. So they're trading at a huge discount. But again, the key is the ability to refinance, uh, which is due in one month's time, I guess, one and a half months. Next slide. Uh, last one is on Valuetronics, uh, which is a contract manufacturer with, a fact with factories in China and Taiwan. So what basically in, the co in conclusion, the earnings have started to stabilize to about 57.8 million to 10 million sing. So if you look at the table on the right, they used to earn in 2021, they earn almost 90 million every half year, but this, this collapsed to 50 plus million. So the main reason is that uh, they are basically a victim of the whole trade war situation because most of their plant, all of their factories was in China. Then when the trade war happened, when Donald Trump imposed all these 50% tariffs, uh, they lost a few customers. So what they did was they actually, thankfully, they actually started a new plant in Vietnam. And, and right now, uh, they got uh, two new customers. So one is a cooling, one is electronic. And these are mainly for their Vietnam plant. So, uh, sorry, there's a typo. So the customers are looking to outsource to Southeast Asia and thank, and because they have a plan there, they managed to catch all these new customers. Uh, the, of course, the reason why customers are only moving to Vietnam now because there's always a speculation the tariff will come down with the new Biden administration and, and most of the customers adopted a wait and see. But when this didn't happen, then this is like the... With, 
because Biden didn't bring down the tariffs with China. So as a result, of this you're seeing this wave of customers uh, still moving out of China, of uh, out of China into Southeast Asia, like Malaysia and also Vietnam. I mean, uh, so that's why they managed to secure customers. And the one that's losing out, I mean, just for info purpose, is the local contract manufacturers, the local Chinese contract manufacturers that have not been able to move out of China. So those who are, they have, that's why I think companies like even Venture can benefit because uh, all these customers that, that have to move out of China, uh, uh, those that have Southeast Asian presence will benefit. Uh, this, there is still a need for a Chinese plant. Uh, the China plant that they have is to serve uh, European and Asian customers shipments. Uh, they also said the labor cost in Vietnam is 30% cheaper. Uh, they're still undergoing their share buyback. Uh, they've only done, I think, one quarter. They have like 44 million of shares to worth of shares to buy. They only done maybe, I don't know, 9 million right now. And they'll be buying back at 53 cents. So for us, this is a, a very deep value stock. Of course, if you exclude cash, I mean, some like to do it, some don't. But if you exclude the cash, uh, this stock is trading about three times PE. And because they've got 1 billion of Hong Kong dollar cash, net cash, I mean, roughly, uh, it's 900 plus, but you, it's about 1 billion. So if you assume... Uh, interest rates rise, uh, I don't know, two percentage points. Uh, actually, most of it is in US dollar and, and, and of, of course, Hong Kong dollars, US dollar, and some of them is in, in Singapore dollar too. So, if you assume two percentage point rise in interest rates, that means that they will enjoy like, I don't know, 20 million Hong Kong dollar, which ironically is now a growth driver for them. Uh. So, if they get like 20 million additional interest, it's going to help their earnings grow by 10, 15%. So even if the operations stay flat, they're just going to get an earnings kicker from the high interest rates. Uh, their, their dividend yield is probably about 3 to 5%. And we think, I think the difficult transition to service issue is over. So their capex can normalize now because the last one, two years, they spent about 100 million Hong Kong dollars on capex. So right now, it's, it's more maintenance capex because most of the transition, the new plant is all set up and all stable. So it's not all about, now it's all about you know, securing new customers for their Vietnam plant. Okay, I think I'm done. Uh, next slide. I think, yeah, that's the end. Do note that uh, our last, uh, can you go to the front page again? Uh, do join our community and our last one will be on the 13th of, of December. Our last morning, is it 13? Okay. Let's go to the very first page. Yeah, so our last one will be on the 12th of December and we will resume on 9th of January. Uh, 11 a.m. because we got feedback that uh, well, that we should do it at 11 a.m. since the Zoom the Zoom actually scheduled at 11, so we will all push it back to 11 a.m. rather than 11:15. Uh, the, the reason why you all time see a reminder at 11 a.m. because Zoom doesn't do 11:15. I'm not sure. You can ask them. We're gonna have a Zoom call, a Zoom webinar. You can actually ask him then. Yeah, thanks. I think we can move on to Q and A. I think I'll take on question on C. So this question here, um, any news about C developing its new games? Yeah, so so C is actually uh, a very tight lip on its uh, game development. It doesn't really, it doesn't really mention anything uh, until uh, the official announcement is made about a particular game. Uh, but they do have a, uh, I guess a pipeline for for game development. Although I think right now the focus for for them is, uh, I mean, given the, the weakness in gaming, I think a lot of the focus right now uh, is it, going to be placed on profitability on its other other segments. Because um, for the longest time, their their whole uh, their, their whole company has been propped up by by Garena and and profits and revenue from Garena. Uh, but but as this uh, kind of uh, I, I guess profitable business kind of starts slowing down uh, the company does recognize that there's a lot more potential in, in uh, uh, e-commerce and uh, it, it's uh, digital financial services so I, I think they're placing a little bit more emphasis on that uh, at the same time they are also I think they also have been cutting some of the jobs in uh, the, the game development department uh, so, so which is also a testament to you know where their direction as a company is heading towards. Thanks.
Oh, okay, uh, let me try to un answer some. Um, uh, Terence, if you want, you can take the property one if you if you want. But uh, l let me just try to answer. So why is Genting so strong lately, given that visitors from China are still muted? Uh, I, I think we, we had a quick note on it uh, two weeks ago. Not so much on Genting. Uh, but Marina Bay Sands, uh, when they release their results, uh, they do give an overview. If you listen to the call, which I, which I did, uh, because it's recorded and it's on the internet, uh, they actually did mention that the the result that um, MBS uh, uh, actually reported the very strong uh, results. Uh, the earnings that they generated for mass market was even better than pre-pandemic. So mass market, especially the 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 slot machines. I, I'm not sure who went who, who went to the slot machine, but but that did very well. And I I and I guess with the re, with conventions returning, that will also benefit their mass market. Uh, for the junket, that didn't rebound so strong. I think junket is still seven. That rebounded strongly too, but that was probably seventy percent of pre-pandemic. So I, I think that's one of the reasons that that uh and because tourism is returning so strongly in Singapore, that has helped. And of course, like you mentioned here, uh, with China still not back yet, so people could be speculating that you no know, next year when China comes back in, uh, Genting would even report even stronger numbers. Yeah, so, so I, I think that's one of the, the some of the reasons. I'm just giving you the, the latest uh, news flow. So they are, so as a result of this, I think the second half will be a, should have a very strong uh, uh, results uh, given what uh, Las Vegas Sands reported on Marina Bay Sands. Yeah, let me get this right. So I hope, hope, hope that that helps. Uh, because uh, Genting doesn't, uh, yeah, Genting need results full, uh, like give detailed results only every half yearly. Uh, hi, Paul. Will a Fed terminal rate of 5% translate to uh, 5% SGS uh, 10 year? Uh, I don't think it will hit a uh, 5% 10 year uh, because right now the U curve is still inverted. Uh, and uh, I usually the US rates are a bit higher, so I, I don't think it would hit 10%. Probably uh, my guess, okay, this is like 99% guess, so it's probably 4.5 or come, come, but I think it will come close to it. The, the reason why we say is that because there's an inversion now, so what inversion means is that the 10 year is lower than the Fed funds rate. So the Fed funds rate might be 5%, but if there's an inversion, that means the 10 year lower. That's why people. It's a, like a sign for recession or what it's worth. Uh, so even if it's a 5% Fed rate, the 10 year could hit 4.5. Then maybe the Singapore 10 year could hit maybe 4.25 or 4. Yeah. Again, this is again for what it's worth, it's like 99.9% .9 guesswork here. <laughs> yeah. Uh Darren, is the Fed likely to slow? Or uh, Darren is on leave today. Uh so likely to slow down hikes in the next few rounds. Does it mean risk at bottom? Yeah, that's a very high chance that the REITs may have bought them uh, by early next year. And also because of the the, tech, the tactical posturing by investors, because if you are going to a recession conditions, then people want to, then everyone will go defensive. Uh, so, so there is a high chance, I think, the REITs may have bought them. Uh, if it, uh, maybe one more hike, then people think that, then the scenario will be, the expectations will be, Definitely a pause, if not a rate cut. Then this would, would help. But we don't again, we don't think the DPUs will rise, but we think the, the DPUs would will, will not grow, but I think it's good enough for the market. Especially the US ones, I think we might mention before, like, like some of these are trading like 30% below. Uh, some of them are even trading 30% below book. Okay, uh high pause seems based on history, US stock market would dip slightly at the beginning of a uh, of a Fed rate. And would go up after that. Why is it if different this time from where the US market is dropping for 10 months? Yeah, every yeah, every situation. I think ultimately uh the, the market moves more on expectations of, of the economy rather than on the Fed right high. So if you go to the chart, you're you're right. When interest rates rise, you notice uh the market actually continues to 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 rise. Uh, because it's all about expectations of growth. Yeah. So so what we, we think. Uh, I think like we, I think I highlighted before, it's more the outlook for the economy rather than whether the Fed rate high or, of course, right now it is because the, uh, in, in terms of the longer term trajectory for the market, it's ultimately going to be where they see the economy. 
So a risk of recession, the market market typically uh, nose dies. Uh, yeah. So that's why even when the Fed cut rates, it doesn't really help the market because because it is all about how, where people view the outlook for the economy. Yeah. So if you go back to that chart, you will notice that the yeah can can you go back to that chart again? The if anyone's controlling it. When interest rate rise, actually the market goes up. So it's because people think the economy is still vibrant. So you look on the chart on the right-hand side, uh, interest rates, let's say the year 2004, right? uh, even though interest rates continue, the Fed continues to hike rates, the market continues to climb because the outlook for the economy was still strong. Uh, Pre-GFC time and, and everything, of course, was a mania. <laughs> Mania then. Even in 2016, when the Fed rate hike, there's a bit of a stumble in the beginning. People are not sure. Uh, but when, even when the Fed continues to hike rates in 2016, the uh, market will continue to, to climb. Yeah, Because on, on expectations, the economic growth was strong. And of course, there was also that Trump factor. He cut interest. Yeah, yeah, he cut taxes and so forth. So, is, is, uh, so in conclusion, interest rate, the direction of the Fed is just one of the one of the variables to consider, it's not like the cut rate means can buy the market. <laughs> well, what lessons can investors learn from the re recent uh, high flux findings? Uh, I mean, I, I did follow high flux yeah, uh, b before it was suspended. I I, I think I, for, for me, it was mainly the understanding of the business. I think uh, they never actually did uh, report good results. If you look through the high flux, uh, the earnings was always very weak. But there was expectations, or I wouldn't say guidance, but there was expectations that that uh, once they turn on to our spring, that the the earnings can uh, could could turn around. Uh, it, it it and also they disappointed in in some of the projects. They were supposed to get an India project too, but that that didn't pan out. And when they they turn on twasping, I think the market didn't realize that the the electricity spreads, the spark spreads, uh, because the they made money from the from the water treatment, but the electricity they lost. So it, there was very little details of it. I think the market just could not was unable to assess the profitability or the viability of the water desalination and also the the electricity. Because the way the de de details was given, the prior projects that they did, they did very well. But the future ones, the market couldn't model. We couldn't really model, uh, model it well. That's the second point. And the third point is that the way the accounting is also structured. So, uh, in the beginning, when they are in the construction phase, right, you the accounting actually shows good good numbers because of the way there's a bit of the, the you call it I freak trough because uh, construction you you can actually you have some. Uh, I know it's a bit confusing, but there's some subjectivity in the way you do the accounting earnings for, for project. So for all the water treatment companies, you can actually uh, push forward the earnings. So you can actually shift a bit of your earnings towards the construction part. That means when you're, when you're doing construction, you can, I wouldn't say shift, la, but you can actually upfront some of the profits because you're actually billing yourself. So the plant might be owned by you as an associate, uh, but you actually earn profit by selling the by constructing the plant for yourself in a way, uh, because when you do when the Hyfax project maybe Hyfax might own thirty percent, the construction then they build they actually earn construction profits. So there's a way for them the accounting wise there's a way to upfront the profit of it. Uh, I mean these are the findings. I mean I'm not sure if I, that actually helps. A bit confusing anyway. Uh, it was just a lack of understanding. A lot of people we just we basically trust or uh, we place a lot of trust on their track record rather than understanding the details of the project. I guess that was the finding for me anyway. <laughs> uh, how about should we be worried about the recession? Hence, may negatively affect share price of Singapore banks or more worried about Fed fund rate increase. And hence, may negatively affect the SING. And, uh, I'll, I'll leave the banks for... Uh, okay, let me just answer for the Singapore banks. Yeah, we, we don't think the re recession in the US will be that deep. Uh, mainly because the labor market is strong and also because a lot of this is nominal. So if you look at the 1970s recession, the economy actually still grew even though in the recession because in nominal terms, in dollar, in 
actually uh, in real terms because once you because the way the account the economists do it they adjust it out for inflation then you get the decline but in nominal terms that actually the economy didn't really contract that badly so that's why we think it will be a bit more shallow and for Singapore uh, Southeast Asia is doing well so for us uh, I think Singapore will be more sheltered because Southeast Asia is, is doing very well if you look at uh, foreign direct investments into Southeast Asia is at record levels I think especially in Malaysia and Vietnam, I think we shared that before. So we don't think that recession conditions will, it, it will definitely slow us down, but I don't think recession conditions are going to hit Singapore. That's why the impact to Singapore banks won't be that bad. And, and you, you know, the ones that, the co economies that do that do well are the commodity exporters, I know, like Indonesia and also um, Malaysia. I'm talking broadly speaking, uh, the rate hike increase, yeah, I think tech sector would probably be hurt the, the, the most, especially on the consumer and if the customers pull back on capital expenditure. I think REITs will be a bit more, uh, a bit more sheltered. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you mean the percentage of complete accounting? Yeah, yeah. So, so for IFIC, IFIC, Chiof, um, you, you, you can either, you can either decide the, you can either recognize the profit during construction stage or recognize it during when you uh, when you actually generate revenue in the project. There's a way, I would say shifting, but there is some subjectivity because when you're building a project, the, the, the accountants will actually ask you how much profit are you expecting to generate from this project. And, and, you know, it's, and, and if you recognize more profit upfront in the construction stage, then when you recognize profit, uh, during the when you're collecting uh, the the revenue from the from power generation from from water collection, it actually comes down lower. Uh, it's a bit confusing. I'm sorry, even the accountants are confused. But that's what I mean now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it, it's not a percentage of uh, it's not percentage of completion accounting method. It's a I think trough. Yeah, it, it is also percentage comp completion, but it's an IFIC, IFIC trial. That means you have to assume they don't look at your cost and then they don't they won't they won't look at the cost and then look at the, the construction. Because in the in the value of the project, I know it's confusing, anymore, but let me just get it out of the way. The value of the project is uh uh it's not just the cost and the margin, it's actually how much profit you're going to generate. There's the IRR completion, it's, it's like a, the DCF of the project. It's no longer, oh, I have a construction profit, then I assume 10% margin. No, it's actually the DCF of it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I don't know. It's, don't ask me why it's so confusing. It's the accountants who did it. Huh? But uh, what's your view on IFAS going forward? Uh, I think, uh, Glenn, you want to help out? Yeah, sorry, give me a minute. Let me uh, change my, why is it this background? Okay. Sorry, give me one second. Uh, okay, so there's uh, one question regarding IFAST. So for IFAS, I think there are four main uh, things that to look forward uh, going forward. First one would be their uh, Hong Kong e-pension uh, revenue. So they are expecting that to come in earlier now uh, compared to their previous guidance. They haven't really given an update on the figures for the revenue yet. But this, hold on, let me see if I can open the, my, my notes. Just give me one second. Huh? So yeah, they're supposed to uh, give a guidance, uh, update to their guidance in early next year. Yes. So the second one would be their uh, IFAS Global Bank. So this is the bank, the UK bank that they acquired in, um, I think, uh, this year. So they are expecting to still have in incur initial startup losses for FY22, but they target to achieve profitability starting 2024. So this is uh, a digital bank which they are 
trying to focus on as well. So I think the um, yeah, uh, that's mainly all for uh, IFAS. So these are the two main growth drivers for them. What are the profit? Think... Do you remember the profit they can make? Yeah, wait, yeah, let me try to get my figure from the profit. Yeah. Uh, okay, now uh, while waiting, for, let me let's go through uh, what is your assessment on the palm oil industry. So, uh, for the for the palm oil, uh, the the price is, has dropped almost five thousand ringgit from. So it so we we this is our own guess. Uh, we think there is some bot. We think there's a bottoming process now. I think the reason why we say that is that there's a huge discount, uh, compared to the. There's, there's a huge discount to palm oil price now compared to the soybean. I, I just slipped my mind how much what was the the huge discount, but I think it's about almost 300 US dollar, and these are like record levels. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons why we think you know, the, the palm oil price could have kind of uh, bottomed, especially if you think uh, China's recovering. So there's a sorry, seven eight hundred dollars spread between uh, palm oil and, and soya bean. And, and this is like four to five times higher than the average. I think the average split between uh, soybean and palm oil is, about, I think, um, around two hundred dollars US. So this is, I don't know, four five times high, uh, I don't know, four times higher uh, roughly. So so that's why we think there is a chance that the palm oil prices have kind of um, bottomed out in that sense. And also, uh, longer term, there hasn't been much new plantings. Yeah, I, I I don't have the details here, but this is just from from recollection. So there's a good chance that the prices may have kind of bottom at, at these levels. Uh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So for the Hong Kong e pension, um, the latest figures that they provided. So this is actually, uh, during their sec first half, uh, briefing. So the net, uh, net revenue what they expect to, uh, add to their net revenue would be. 280 million Hong Kong dollars in 2023, uh, 900 million Hong Kong dollars in 2024, and 1.3 billion Hong Kong dollars in 2025. So currently for the first half, it was only 69 million Hong Kong dollars, first half of 2022. And this is, if we translate it to profits, it will be 17 million Sing dollars in 2023, 44 million Sing dollars in 2024, and then 88 million Sing dollars in 2025. So it would be a very significant, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me, very significant increase to their net profits. Okay, I'll hand it back to the rest of my. Let me see if I got any more questions. Okay, I'll hand it to the rest of my colleagues. Yeah, I'll probably jump in. Uh, here, Glenn. Uh, yeah, let's take the question on the property. What are your views on Guaco Land, Sing Land, and property in general? So we got no coverage on Guaco land, Sing land, land, but we can comment on uh, the property market in general. Uh, so for I, I think when we look at the, the developers now, in terms of their sentiment, when we, when we talk to management of Guaco and, and CDL, they are generally it's still positive on the, the, the Singapore property market. Uh, but, and the reason is because this is when they, they look at all the new launches that have been launched this year, like Lentor Modern, Piccadilly Grand, uh, most of these uh, launches were all sold at 80%, uh, was 80% sold, and then they still see healthy numbers. So two things. La. One is the the uh, number of units sold is eight, oh, all the new launch first day, 80% sold, and even for the latest Tampanis uh, EC that was launched also saw a very good reception. The second is that the uh, price per uh, square feet PSF also keep hitting uh, a new highs of 2,000 uh, PSF on average. So the, the property developers are uh, uh, positive on the, the market because mainly because of the, the, the deal for supply in the market. But at the same time, you can tell that they are very cautious also in terms of bidding for new land bank. And because the, they, are, they are not sure of how uh, the the the, the interest rate trajectory will go. I think like the, the team mentioned this earlier in their presentation. So in terms of how uh, the terminal uh, rate for interest rate, so they are very cautious in terms of bidding for new land. They, they, they are extremely selective now. So if you look at some of the new sites, uh, in terms of the, the bidding, you can see that the number of developers who, who go and bid for lands also, also drop, uh, like the, the, the ones in Pukitima, uh, uh, government land sales, they, they've, they've really trimmed that down. So the I think overall, to just summarize, it's 
positive, but just that the, they, are, they are very cautious and the, it will also be very slow. Uh, so yeah, that's, I think that's all for me. I'll hand back the time to the rest of my team. Uh, Terence, you want to take the, the windfall tax on? Because I think it might hit the Jankos. On, all, all and gas companies and Jankos. Uh, UK windfall. Yeah, let me, sorry, let me just go and uh, see what, what this is. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll come back to the question. Thanks. So, so the, the windfall tax, uh, the, the windfall tax that they're imposing, of course, on the oil and gas companies, uh, for the oil and gas, gas companies, SGX, there's, uh, there's no impact from my knowledge of, for, for oil and gas, because the only two oil and gas is Rex. Rex is normally Norway and Oman. RH Petro Gas is mainly in Indonesia. So uh, from the oil and gas perspective, companies has no impact. But for the Jenkos, uh, uh, I think uh, we'll let uh, Terence... Uh, yeah. Where can I view the record? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, so I just, just jump back to the question. Uh, yeah, on, on at least for the, the counters under our coverage, uh, in terms of the 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 Gen Coast, uh, Keppel and 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 uh, Samco Industries, we don't see uh, any impact on them because because Samco Industries mainly operate the the battery segment. So this 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 uh wind vortex, from what we will uh, understand from them, there's no impact uh, and also for Keppel also. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Where can you view the recording for this session? Uh, it's usually on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay, let me answer one when we go back to uh, uh, we can go back to Zane for ten. What should we be looking out for in terms of Malaysia general election and new government? Example, um, okay, uh, I'm, I don't really see much of the of the impact for the Singapore market. I'm referring to. Uh, Usually there's a change in government. I'm not sure who's government, but usually there, there could be a bit of uh, I guess standstill in terms of of getting approvals and, and but for Singapore companies, I don't see any because we are not big. We don't. Uh, I don't think many of the SGX companies go after big government projects. So I guess if you are you have a government project in Malaysia which is pending signature, then maybe you have some issues with that. But from what I recall, I don't remember of any. Uh, of, of course, there are some that have property projects that are stuck there, but apart from that, I don't see uh, any of those SGX companies listed uh, that has any impact that I know of. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure if I answered that, but yeah. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Zin. Thanks, Paul. Let me share my screen. Okay, so first one is first one is uh, Singtel. So for Singtel, uh, recently after the results, we had a strong rally and it looks like we tested a double top here at around 276. And if we look higher up, there's also this uh, trend line resistance acting on it. So the if it continues to go up, maybe we can see resistance at 280 also. Uh, for now, I think probably we'll get some pullback to maybe the support, this green color support zone. Uh, that's about 260 to, to about 268. Uh, area over here. Okay, BRC, BRC Asia. Uh, after the rally, after a uh, rally, uh, for most part of this year, it's probably is only trading in a sideways formation for now. So, uh, we only the the first resistance right coming to is about one at the one seventy two level, uh, over here. Uh, from the resistance over here. So 172 onwards to about the high of 177, 178 will be a strong resistance over here. As for now, the, the support is this, this level that we broke over here. That's about 166 to 168. Then the lower end will be at the 160s to, to 163 level over here. So I guess we'll probably continue to trade in a sideways direction for BRC Asia. Okay, then Hobi Land. Hobi Land, uh, after the uptrend was broken around uh, September this year, there's a strong uh, downward momentum over here. So currently, the support was found at the around the 50% Fibonacci retracement near $2.30. 
if you take the lows from the March uh, March 2020 lows to the highs uh, in April this year. So we found the support is over there uh, and we had a bounce over here. So for now, I think the resistance is uh, at this red color zone about 245 to 254 area over here. So likely, um, if this support level at 225 can hold, probably we'll probably see a sideways trading for now also. Okay, moving on to the Kong stocks. So for Hang Seng Tech, uh, after we broke out this downtrend line uh, last week, we tested uh, the previous uh, support over at the 380 level, which now turned resistance over here. So we saw some selling that's taking place over here. So I think uh, we can possibly see a pullback to the to, to test this previous resistance turn support. Now that's about 338 level. So this green color zone tree, about 3. Uh, 18 to 338 over here, probably act as a support for Hang Seng Tech for now. Okay, then moving on to Ping An Insurance. Ping An Insurance also uh, similar. So after we broke this key, this key level here around $41.50, uh, we broke out, but we then we reached this red color resistance area where the previous support over here around the $44 mark to, to about $47.30 over here. So we, we saw this uh, hanging man candlestick over here. Then we saw some selling take place. So for now, I think we could possibly see a pullback to about the, this green color support area here. Uh, that's about $36.40 to about uh, $39.50 area. So that's the ranging from the 30.2% to 61.8% retracement levels over here for the ping for ping on insurance. The last one is 10 cents. So 10 cents also similar. This key previous uh, support around 298, 299 over here. Uh, after we broke it, we did a retest uh, last week. Then we saw some selling, temporary selling coming in for now. So I think uh, there's a chance that the pullback continues to uh, to this green color area of uh, around 244 to 259 over here. So this was the, another key uh, uh, sub resistance level we broke out from during this uh, rally over here. So there's a chance that we will come back to uh, retest this level at near the 50% uh, retracement level that's near $250 for 10 cents. Okay, moving on to the three local banks. So for DBS, um, last week, uh, we continued the uh, rally after breaking uh, this $4.70 uh, area over here. Then we hit a double top. Or, uh, we tested this double top resistance around $35.90 area. So uh, it hit our target, uh, which was uh, for the for our fourth quarter uh, strategy uh, target price over here. So congrats uh, if you actually uh, went in. So for now, uh, looks like possibly some, uh, could be some profit taking that's taking place over here. So for now, I would expect uh, maybe a retest of this previous resistance of about 34, 30 to 34, 40 uh, area. Then the lower end of the support will be at around this horizontal level. That's about 33, 40 over here. So that's for DBS. And UOB will be hit the, the $30 and around $30.50 area, which is a 78.6% retracement level. Uh, and then uh, it was a previous support level over here as well. So that could become a, as a resistance. But if you could do a time higher, the next Resistance lookout for is about uh, $31.20 over here, which is the swing high back in March this year. So for now, if uh, if we follow the, uh, if, it, if it does follow DBS to do possible pullback, the immediate support will lie at about um, 30, sorry, uh, 20, 20, around $29 to about 
29.50 over here, this green color support area. And OCBC Bank, we broke out of this, uh, this resistance over here around 12.40, but uh, we tested about 12.60. Currently, we're seeing some selling over here. So 260 last time over here was a previous support over here with that where after that we had a big gap down and selling. So there could be some resistance that's acting over here uh, for now. But if we overcome 260, slightly we will test this 1290 uh, year high level over here. So for now, if it, it does a pullback, the immediate support, we can expect it to go to this green color area. So that's about... Uh, Eleven ninety to twelve dollars uh, zone over here. That's acted as a support quite a few times back then. Okay, then HR Net Group. So HR Net um this one has a very wide trading range. So for most part of this year, it's trading in a very big range over here. So for now, uh, looks like it's gonna. Maybe you're gonna make a sideways trade for now after clearing uh 79 cents. And for now, we're seeing uh 80 and a half cents acting as a level of resistance for now. So probably some sideways uh trading for now. Uh support range around 76 cents to about 77 and a half cents, which was the previous resistance level over here. Uh but if you do get lower then the next support zone to look out for will probably be at 74 cents to 75 cents. Uh, level for prop next. Prop next is in uh quite a big uh descend descending triangle over here. So this key downtrend resistance line, uh, we tested it last week. That's about uh, around the near one sixty level. So uh one sixty here we could see some resistance to to this swing high over here around one sixty five. There's also resistance. Uh, the immediate support is probably around the 145, 146 level back over here, this swing low support. And it's also a support that is tested uh, multiple times over here. And back then, it was a resistance level as well. Then the next key support level below to watch out for is around 135, which is a support back then in June 2021. And uh, we actually uh, breached over here, breached this level this year, but we came back above where then after that, we had a small rally over here. So these are the two key support levels to watch out for for prop next. Then as for Fraser Center Point, uh, after we did a double bottom around 190, currently we're seeing a retest of this resistance over here. So the swing high was about 205 over here. Then we saw some selling take place. And it's also matched with the 30.2% Fibonacci level. When we use this swing high at two, around 230s to, to the swing low around 190. So probably some uh, selling take place over here for now. But if we manage to clear this two, 205, 206 level, it's likely we go to about um, around 210, uh, 210 to about two, 213 level, uh, which is a 50% level and possibly a retest of this downtrend resistance over here. And for now, the support is at uh, this 190, around the 190 to 193 uh, swing lows over here for Fraser Center Point. Okay. Uh, first resources, is there MECD bullish divergence? So for now, the stock has been uh, in this trend over here, then it has been moving up recently. Uh, MACD also has been moving up as well. So I think uh, there's bullish uh, momentum coming in. So for now, it looks like uh, after we cleared this key resistance at 153 to 159 over here, uh, stock is seeing some pullback for now. So possibly we could retest this uh, channel resistance over here at one, uh, 162. Uh, lower end probably might go to about 153, I, I think. Uh, for now, the resistance is acting at about 177 level. And, uh, if you move higher, the resistance could be at 177, which was a previous resistance level last time. 
in the last year, October. And then it's also a 50% le retracement level when we measure from the high at 228 to the low at around 126 for first resources. Okay, Samuel Dera shipping is next. So Samuel Dera, uh, in this key downtrend channel over here. So last week we actually popped out of it. Then we had a subsequent immediate uh, bullish engulfing, sorry, bearish engulfing uh, candle over here. And the selling actually continued down. So the resistance is clear, it's at about uh, this 94 and a half cents previous support zone over here, stretching to about 102 over here, this swing high. For now, the support could uh, be at around this green color zone which is the 61.8 to 50% retracement level of 87.5 cents to 90.5 cents area. And it was also the area that the, over here where the stock broke out over here. So if a back test over here could do, could become a support for Samudera shipping. Then uh Yang Tuzhang shipbuilding. So last week I mentioned uh this key down this key uh trendline resistance will be an important one to take note at of at around 142. Uh subsequently the stock pulled back uh last week. So currently now we are uh testing this uh trend line support over here. So about 127 is the support which uh, we reached today. So about, I think the 124 to 127 level will be a, a, a support for Yang Zhejiang. While the resistance is at, you can expect resistance around this trend line resistance over here. That's about uh, 132 to 135 level over here. So currently, I think you'll probably trade in a, a narrow range for now if it's gonna stay in this uh, wedge over here. Then for Semcorp Industries, Semcorp Industries, after we broke out of this downtrend channel over here, uh, we tested the uh, swing high over here around 313. That's a 50% retracement level when we use the high around 350 to the low end, around 276. Uh, for now, it looks like we'll possibly do a sideways trading for now. So the this immediate uh, swing low support to around 291 is uh sorry around 285 something to take note of then the resistance is around here near the three dollar ten cent level for some industries okay then uh ums so we had a the the rally uh we had a strong rally over here then uh Previous support over here, 122 to 128 level, probably uh previous support will turn into a probably turn into a resistance over here. Then um we we'll expect some resistance to come in. So then the immediate support, I think if it does a pullback, probably will be at around 1, 107 to 113 level, which is our previous uh, support and resistance zone over here. Then uh, Comfort Delgro, so Comfort Delgro in this uh, downtrend channel over here, uh, last week we had a sell down to test this channel support. So currently we are seeing some indecision around here. So for now, probably support is at 1, 2, 3, while the resistance for now is at 1, 2, 8 level. Uh, uh, there's a chance that if 1, 2, 3 is broken, we can possibly test the swing low last time in March 2020 of about 120. So that's to note for Comfort Del Grow. Then uh, Jardine CNC. Okay, Jardine CNC, we broke down of this uptrend channel over here. And then we found, uh, when we did a back test over here, we found resistance at the $31.60 to 
uh, level over here. So the resistance likely at 3160 to 3260 over here. While the support, currently we are doing a back, uh, retest of this swing nose level around 2950 to $30.30 to be a support for uh, Jardin. Uh, if we break this level, it's likely 20, around 2870. This horizontal level will be another support for Jardin. So for now, I think possibly the uptrend has turned and turned into a downtrend given that we, we, we rejected uh, this uh, channel uh, over here. Best, best world. Okay, for best world, it looks like uh, there's resistance for this downtrend uh, trend line over here. So uh, trading in a small range over here for now. So um, last week, the swing low was at 157. So that's a uh, immediate support to take note. While the resistance probably at 176 onwards to about 187, this level, her swing high level of last week. Uh, but if you go down lower, the next support, key support level could be near 133, which was a previous uh, resistance level, uh, support over here, and then uh, support over here as well. Agenting, very strong. So we rally even out of this uh, trend channel over here. So for now, I think uh, around the 88 cents level could be a swing high resistance to take note of over here. Then uh, if the rally continues, we could possibly see the price hit up to maybe 90 cents to 92 cents level, another swing high resistance for Genting. So for now, the support probably be around at 85 cents level if you do a back test of this channel um, trend line over here. Uh, okay, China Aviation. So last week, uh, we hit a high of uh, this seven, around 79 cents area over here. Uh, a bit short of this uh, swing low spot could be a resistance at 81 half cents. For now, I think uh, we could take this as a resistance. And for now, we're doing a pullback. So if this support at uh, around the 71 cents holds, right, possibly we could be seeing a mini uptrend for now. If, we are forming higher highs and higher lows in this stretch. So for now, uh, let's go and see whether this support can hold for a possible short-term uptrend to form from this uh, downtrend over here. The ISDN currently still in a downtrend channel. Uh, for now, possibly trading in a sideways pattern so the clear support over here is at uh, around the 36 cents level while resistance is near the 39 cents to 40 cents mark. So possibly still trading in this uh, range. The next, but if you break down 36 cents, I think the next support level, key support level is near the 32 cents to 33 cents level over here. While the, Resistance after you break 40 cents will be at uh, 41 and a half cents above over here. 41 and a half cents to 44 cents, possibly. Job. Wow. The Jaffa, uh, the downtrend is still strong over here. So last week, uh, we did a retest of this. Immediate resistance at 53, uh, 53 cents over here. Um, possibly continue to see maybe a sideways trading for now. So the support level to note will be around here at uh, this range of 46 and a half cents to 49 cents zone over here. But the resistance can stretch from 
53, 53 cents, then the next level upwards to watch is uh, around 56 cents, then followed by 58 cents for Jaffa. Then Xing Xiong is still trading in an uptrend channel for now. So the channel support is at 160. But if we take the horizontal level over here, it could go to 155 to 150 level. While the resistance over here could be at 164 to this swing high at 167. So it's either for now, I think we could be trading in a small sideways direction or continue to move uh, back up in the channel. And then Wilma, Wilma, after we broke down this key uh, support zone at three, around 380 to 390s, uh, we, we dipped below it, then we had a rally back up over here. So for now, I think the, the resistance uh, could be at, the next resistance to watch out for is this, right, around the 420s, around 424 to 428 level over here, we had two swing highs back then. And it's also a 61.8% retracement level from the 470 to 346 over here. As for immediate support wise, it will be this resistance that broke out of over here, three, uh, around 395, 396 level. Then the lower end of the support around 383 over here. So for now, the uptrend is still intact over here, higher, higher, higher lows. So I would think if this 395 level can hold, possibly we could continue to see a continuation of the rally over here to test this 424 to 428 range. Okay, then AEM, uh, so downtrend over here, but we broke out of this sending triangle formation over here. Uh, resistance at three, around the three, 370 level, near 370s. Uh, which should match with this uh, 61 percent retracement level. So for now, I think for now, the stock is currently like pulling back. So we could see a retest of this 336 uh, horizontal key level. Uh, if it's supported, we could see uh, the uptrend continue for, for now, given that we form uh, higher highs and higher lows of this stretch. Okay, I'll just cover the last one on nanofilm. So nanofilm, uh, the bearish pattern still very strong. So downtrend channel, we broke down over here. Then uh, we have a downtrend resistance line over here as well. Then last week, the stock was kind of like sideways, but uh, it met resistance at the 140, this key level. And then it also broke this uh, swing low over here at around 130, 135. So for now, it's making new lows at 127, which is the historical low. So for now, there's no, uh, there's no good support that I can gauge for nanofilm. But the resistance probably will become this area over here, 135 to 142 area. So for now, probably the downtrend will still continue until we see another possible like sideways uh, pattern form or, or bounce taking place for nanofilm. So uh, that's all from me. Uh, Maybe I'll uh, pass on my time to the rest of my team to answer the question on REITs and T bills. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, there was also a question on on, on digital core uh, read. Uh, they, they never invite us for briefing, so we, we hardly get to, 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 to meet them and Darren's not around, but uh, let me just give you my, my own view. Uh, for what it's worth, probably not much, but for, for, for I think the problem for for data center reads is that uh, they, there isn't much organic growth. Uh, why we say that is because there isn't much um, rental growth embedded in the contracts because some of them, they deal a lot with the uh, hyperscalers. You know, hyperscalers is like you know, Facebook and so So hyperscalers don't really give you much uh, growth. To, uh, I'm not sure. I think maybe 2% or 1% or 2% uh, rental growth. It's not like... Uh, so so it's, it's not like if you're doing an office, then every three years, you can at least reprice your office to the higher rental rates. 
but there's limited organic growth. So, so from my own understanding is that like for guys like Apple, DCV and so on, they managed to grow because the share price did so well. I mean, they are trading at uh, 1.5 times a book, above book. And it's one of those few business when a strong share price actually helps the business because with a strong share price, they can actually acquire more creatively. Uh, so if that, and it's more pronounced for data centers, uh, but if that path to grow a strong share price, because with a strong share price, everything acquires a creative, unless you buy in Japan, now because Japan interest rate is so low or what they're doing is buying in, in, in China uh, but without that, I think they were they are the probably the most impacted uh, by high interest rates because there's limited organic growth. I think from my own understanding, because they seldom review uh, what is the annual incremental uh, right increase in in rents uh, in their contracts. Uh, yeah, if from my uh, discussions with them, but I think maybe Darren can give you more. But that's my own view. Uh, uh, until you see a. Probably when if there's a pivot in the interest rates or interest rates decline, probably they are the ones who will benefit the most because they are almost like the in the in the read in the read universe they are probably like the most zero coupon type of bond because there's limited organic growth for them compared to the rest. Uh, but, but the the last one is uh what what is your view what is your view of investing in REITs versus T bills versus bonds. I, I think for me, the, the, the main difference, at least from my own view, is that where we see the, the point in time when it, the economic contraction is very pronounced, I mean, the, when the whole market derates and things that you know, we are in a very sharp recession and so forth, that is when the flows will, will go back into bonds. Of course, I'm doing the, we are trying to do, of course, we're always trying to do the best timing here. But for, for me, I think it will be REITs and T-bills uh, then as we transition later part of the year or middle part of the year when when the economic weakness is more pronounced and people start to you know, uh, be exceptionally more concerned about uh, how where global growth is happening. The trick is, I mean, whether is it now, whether six months are really, it's very hard to time this, but it, the pivotal time when people, when investors believe uh, uh, we are entering to a very deep recession in the US or when the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates, that's when we will swing back into bonds because they will be the big winner. So for me, I think at least the six months, my own guess is that uh, REITs and T-bills will be the best before you swing into, into bonds because there's still a few, uh, two or three more rate hikes coming up. Yeah. Uh, of, yeah, of course, doing that magical timing is almost, is extremely difficult, but that's just my own uh, thinking. Yeah. When is it better to go into, when can bonds outperform REITs and T-bills? But I think REITs and T-bills will be the ones that outperform first. Yeah, my own view. Uh, please check sets. Uh, is it? Uh, okay, I'm not sure is it technical, but uh, let me just, uh, uh, sorry for the, not very clear uh, what is the question, but let me just answer the, the last one. Uh, CSC global rights issue. Uh, what, is, what is your view? Um... The problem is that the rice issue, I think, is 30, 33 cents. The share price now is 35. So I'm not sure whether is there a need to even take the rice issue because the 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 third price, that means the transact the the price after the rice issue may not actually if it's so close to the rice issue, <laughs> there's really no 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 point in taking the, the rice if I'm not mistaken. But uh for CSE, the outlook, uh the next I think the next quarter earnings might be quite weak uh, from what they they I didn't have time to to, to do a flip on the ground yet, but I think they are, there's quite a bit of uh, margin pressure for them because they spend a lot of money uh, building building up two new business which is the water business so uh, CSE is, is strong in shale production so they do the systems for shale uh, they're, they're also strong in, very, uh, in oil and gas in the deep fields uh, they're also strong in radio business. Uh, they are making a rights issue because they are acquiring two businesses, one in US and one in uh, Australia. So I think next year will be stronger uh, for, for them because they are the, they've secured record order books. But just that they are under a bit of a margin pressure right now. Uh, the margin pressure will alleviate next year because they had to spend a lot of development costs to uh, this year 
because they were going to new water business in, in Texas, Houston, water treatment business. So because of that, you get uh, quite a bit of margin pressure in the second half of this year because they announced third quarter update, but there was no results given. So I think in the near term, we, we, they will face a bit of pressure on the margins, but uh, I think next year, next year, next year will be much better for them. In terms of taking up the rice issue, if it's so close to 33 cents, uh, I don't have the details, but if you do the theoretical x rice price and it's not much difference from the 34 and a half cent now, I think there's uh, I think no purpose taking it because yeah, you know, it's it's just if, if if after the rice issue, the share price only goes back to 34 cents, yeah, I think there's no purpose. I don't have the details off offhand. Uh, sorry for that. Uh I think if you ask Nixon, let me try and get the details or or you can post in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Quick comments on net link trust and capital infrastructure. Uh, I can comment on net link trust. For us, we are just a bit cautious now. Uh, if, because the dividend yield is only five, uh, 6%, I must well just buy a REIT. The, uh, the reason uh, I cover net link trust, uh, the reason people buy net link trust was because there was uh, safety in that 5% because it's a thermostat link company and most of their earnings is very stable. But at this juncture, 6%, I don't think it is, it is worth it. I'd rather just buy a REIT. At least I can get the rental growth. There's no rental growth in there's no, there's no rental growth. There's no growth in net link trust. Uh, you didn't need growth. I mean, when interest rates were so low, right? There was uh, like one percent or two percent. But right now, when interest rate climbs so much, I definitely need growth because uh, there's interest rate uh, pressure. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to mention our uh, terrorism on capital infrastructure. Okay, I don't think yeah, maybe Terence is not around. Uh, yeah, if you do have questions, no, do do post it on our on our community. Then we can come and help you on it, especially if you have sets question and capital infrastructure trust. I think with that, I think uh, reaching one pm, I think we'd like to thank everyone. Uh, sorry, I think I know there are two questions we didn't answer, but do, do go to our poems three community and you post it, and we will definitely uh, address your questions there if you do have. Again, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, and, and thanks for your time and hope to see you again uh, next week and uh, yeah thank you everybody and have a good week ahead thanks